Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother forty wax, and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father forty-one. Hi, this is Kathleen, and I'm here with part two of the Lizzie Borden case. In this video, I'm going to discuss the reasons of why I think Lizzie Borden did in fact murder her parents or her father and stepmother. Even though she was found not guilty, I believe that she is really the only person who actually murdered her parents and really planned it out beforehand and did the deed herself and then afterwards. Afterwards, you know, she might have had some people lie for her for various reasons in court or whatever, but I don't think that anybody else was involved in the murder. So she's my number one suspect even though she was found not guilty by a jury all those years ago. And a lot of my reasons have are very similar to those of the reasons that Professor Douglas Olinder wrote about previously. He, um, D Professor Douglas Olinder wrote 14 reasons to believe Lizzie murdered her parents. And so I'm going to read his reasons and tell you why I agree with them and what I think about his reasons. Lizzie Borden, to me, is the, the number one prime suspect. All the other people who were in the house or possibly could have done it or a stranger, I don't believe there was any way for that to be possible due to the evidence and the circumstances of this case. So, according to Professor Douglas Olinder, 14 reasons to believe Lizzie murdered her parents. The first reason he gives is, if not Lizzie, then who? Only Lizzie had a good opportunity to commit the murders. At the time of her mother's murder, around 9.30 a.m., household guest John Morse was visiting relatives. Sister Emma was out of town. Andrew Borden was running errands around town, and maid Bridget Sullivan was outside washing windows. Only Lizzie was known to be in the house at the time of Abby Borden's murder. To commit both murders, Andrew Borden was murdered around 11 a.m. An outside intruder would have either have had to hide in the house for 90 minutes or departed and then returned without being seen. So that's the first reasons of Professor Linder's 14 reasons to believe Lizzie, Lizzie murdered her parents. And you know, that's very much common sense. If you look at the timeline, who else could have done it? And who else would have had the motive to do it or the, the desire to do it? And in that quick time, you know, it had to be somebody who planned it out. And who else would have planned it out? In my opinion, it would have been Lizzie. I don't believe that John Morse, her visiting uncle, her mother's, her biological mother's brother, who was there just visiting, happened to be visiting at the, around that time, I don't believe that he planned to come there to murder them. And I don't believe that he worked with Lizzie Borden to commit the murders or encouraged her to do it or anything like that. Her sister Emma was out of town. You know, one theory is that her sister Emma came back from out of town, committed the murders, and then left. You know, what be better um, alibi to have than to be out of town? But I don't believe that happened either. I believe she would have been seen if she came. The way that the, the neighborhood was, the way the houses were situated, somebody would have seen her if she came back into town. They would have seen her at the house or walking up towards the house or the back of the house. And the same with John Morse, the uncle, when he said he was visiting relatives. I believe he was because I believe somebody who lived around the house or the maid would have seen him in the house at the time of the murders, around the time of the murders, if he wasn't really off visiting with relatives at that time. And remember, it could have just been Lizzie you know, knew her sister would be away. Maybe she encouraged her sister to go away. And she knew John Morris would be off visiting relatives. And maybe she thought him being there would be a perfect time to commit the murder, as maybe he would be considered a suspect, which he was for a while there. You know, maybe 
Lizzie was that diabolical and excuse me, manipulative and that cunning. You know, if she was a psychopath, which she might have been, because to be able to commit those murders, you know, you might have to be a psychopath. Which, when, like when I say psychopath, I mean evil. I know it has a clinical definition too, and it, she also fits the clinical definition, I would think. Remember in her past, she was a thief. She liked to shoplift. She would lie. I mean, her own father locked his bedroom door, but left the keys in the house because they had had some jewelry stolen at an earlier time and stuff like that. So, you know, Lizzie had some issues, so she was probably capable of planning out and thinking about and, and you know, being diabolical enough to plan this out to where she was in the house at the, you know, I don't think she just started in anger. You know, one theory is that she just started whacking on her stepmother when they got in an argument and then, well, she had to kill her dad because he would know it was her, be mad at her if she killed his wife. But I think she planned to kill both of them to inherit the, the family fortune. And I think she she had been thinking about it and planning it for a long period of time. I think she had a lot of anger and resentment built up in her for her stepmother, which, you know, her stepmother may have been not a very nice woman or not a very good motherly figure for her. Because remember, Lizzie knew her stepmother since she was three years old. If I remember correctly, her dad married her stepmother when she was only three years old. So you would think that a little girl that young would get attached to her stepmother since she didn't have a mother at the time her mother had passed away and get to know her and as her own mother. But I read in the past that it was due to her older sister who was old enough to have known their biological mother a lot better, who resented the stepmother, and that she probably had a lot to do with Lizzie not attaching to the stepmother as her mother. And the older sister took care of Lizzie a lot, and the older sister resented her dad remarrying and having a stepmother. So maybe if Lizzie had been an only child, maybe she would have grown to love her stepmother, and her stepmother would have you know, taking her in as her own daughter and they would have had a better relationship or maybe not. I don't know, you know what kind of personality her stepmother had. So who knows? Okay, so the number two reason, according to Professor Linda Linder, is that it looked like an inside job. Police found no signs of forced entry into the Borden home, despite the fact that the Bordens habitually locked their doors and nothing appeared to have been stolen. No stranger was seen entering or leaving the Borden house on the morning of the murders. So there's that point again that no stranger was seen entering or leaving the Borden house on the morning of the murder. So no uh, murderer just traveling through town was seen. And also, remember, like I said, nobody saw Emma there or the uncle come back to the house after he left before the murders and the maid she was seen outside washing the windows at different times that day so you know she, she wouldn't have been in the house long enough to have done that and then come back outside with no blood on her and you know she, so she, I, there's no way I think she's the murderer and also they did lock their doors a lot like they, they would go out lock them, come back in with a key and so forth. And so there was no nobody busted in a door or a window. There was no broken window, no busted open door. And there was nothing stolen that um, the police saw and nothing that, you know, Lizzie or anybody else in the home said was stolen. So there was nothing stolen. There was just two murdered people in the home. The number three reason Professor Linder gives is that although Lizzie claimed to have been downstairs at the very time her mother was violently murdered, her stepmother, 
upstairs, she said she heard no alarming noises. This despite her stepmother having been struck multiple times with an axe and falling to the floor. And if you've seen the pictures of her stepmother, she was a robust woman, maybe not a very a tall woman, but she was a bit, bit chunky. And back then, remember homes, you know, made out of wood, they didn't have um, indoor air conditioning and stuff like that. So you would think that if somebody was just above you being hacked to death with an ax and she fell to the floor that you would hear a commotion or hear something, but Lizzie said she didn't hear nothing. So if she was lying, that would, you know, be another reason to think that she did commit the murders because why would she lie about that if she wasn't actually the person who committed the murders. In other words, if she had heard somebody attacking her mother and father, wouldn't she have, you know, ran to see who it was, to see what's going on? And then she would have told the police, yes, yeah, I saw so-and-so doing something to them. But she didn't say that. She said she heard nothing. The fourth reason that Professor Linder gives is that on August 3rd, the day before the murders, Witnesses identified Lizzie Borden as having visited Smith's Drug Store in Fall River where she attempted to purchase a poison, Prusik Acid. She explained that she needed the acid to clean a sealskin cape. The druggist refused to sell the Prusik Acid. So, if Lizzie had indeed been trying to buy poison just the day before her parents were killed, that's, you know, circumstantial excuse me, circumstantial evidence to show that maybe she was thinking about it before that August 4th and that she was thinking about other ways to do it. And if she had gotten the poison, she would have just simply poisoned their food that they ate or something like that. So, you know, that was very suspicious in, you know, in the trial transcript and so forth, you know, According to the witnesses and stuff, you know, she was seen by more than one person, not just a drugstore um, pharmacist or employee. So, and also that, you know, prosic acid to clean a seal skin cape wasn't really something that people did. So, for whatever reason, a druggist refused to sell it to her. So, I guess he was smart. I wonder if it was just common back then. You couldn't sell that kind of poison to just anybody for any reason or if he thought something might be up or something maybe he, he knew of her or her reputation okay and the fifth reason that professor linder gives is on the night before the murders lizzie visited a neighbor alice russell and told her that she feared that some unidentified enemy of her father's might soon try to kill him well how convenient that's just how convenient the night before your father gets slaughtered, you tell a neighbor friend that you think someone might soon try to kill him. Well, who and why? Her father may not have been a popular man, but why would she think or know that someone was gonna try to kill him soon? It's just very convenient. Like it's just her way of you know, getting it out there that her father had enemies and one day he's going to show up dead. And so if he shows up dead, people need to know that one of his unidentified enemies came to murder him. But like I said before, nobody saw any strangers around on the day of the murders. Okay, the number six reason that Professor Linda gives is that Lizzie told police that while she was alone in the house with her mother on the morning of the murder, a messenger came to the door with a note summoning her mother, her stepmother, to visit a sick friend. Lizzie told people that she assumed her mother had left. Despite a thorough search of the boarding home, no such alleged note ever was found. So number one, no note that Lizzie claimed to have received was ever found in the home or you know around or on or in her stepmother's clothing if Lizzie had like given the note to her so there was no note ever found so that's another lie that Lizzie got 
called in was there was no paper anywhere around. And also nobody saw the supposed messenger come to the home to give that note, to give that message. So nobody heard the messenger knock or come to the door or saw them and nobody saw the actual note that Lizzie said that she got. So that's one, you know, I believe Lizzie committed the murder. So one thing she messed up, well, one of many things she messed up on was that she, she could have just said somebody verbally, somebody she did not know verbally came to the door and, and you know, came to the door and verbally said so-and-so, but she said they actually left a note, but she didn't have the note to show police. So that was just one of many, many mistakes that she made in her lies and telling that's and, her, and telling her stories that day on August 4th, the day that they, her parents were murdered. Okay, the number seven reason that Professor Linda gives was when Bridget Sullivan, who was the maid, came back inside ab after having finished washing outside windows around 10.30 a.m., she reported hearing a muffled laugh coming from upstairs. She assumed that it was Lizzie making the noise. Lizzie, of course, denied being upstairs during this time period between her mother's murder and her father's murder. So Lizzie said she was not upstairs during the time period when her stepmother was being murdered or her father was being murdered. But the maid said that after she finished washing the windows from on, on the outside and came in around 10.30 a.m., she heard Lizzie laughing and it came from upstairs. And she assumed that it was Lizzie making the noise. I mean, she was... Now, she worked there long enough to know Lizzie's voice and how she would sound if she laughed. And so she, you know, didn't identify it as being as her, the stepmother's laugh or the father's laugh or some stranger's laugh. So, according to the maid, she heard Lizzie upstairs. The number eight reason, according to Professor Linda, Linder, excuse me, that's L-I-N-D-E-R, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, at the time of the murder of Andrew Borden, Lizzie claimed to have been in the loft in the backyard barn for 15 to 20 minutes looking for lead sinkers for a fishing excursion. Police found the loft so stiflingly hot that it was difficult to believe anyone would voluntarily remain in such a place for as much as 20 minutes. They also found no footprints in the loft that could substantiate Lizzie's story. So Lizzie got caught in another lie because none, none of her footprints were found in the loft. And it was so hot, why would anybody be up there 15 to 20 minutes looking for something when it was that hot, when they didn't have to be up there? And it was just odd that she said that she was looking for lead sinkers to go fishing at that time. Just, you know, another thing, you know, how convenient she had another story, another reason why she wasn't in the home murdering her parents. The number nine reason Professor Linder gives for Lizzie having committed these murders is that Lizzie had a strained relationship with her stepmother. They usually ate their meals separately. Some theorized that Lizzie resented the fact that her father transferred a Falls River property to Abby's sister. Abby was her stepmother's name, rather than to her. Police noted that during her interview, Lizzie insisted that her stepmother, Abby, be described as her stepmother, not her mother. So obviously, just obviously, Lizzie had a lot of anger and resentment towards her stepmother. And her father, too, because her father's the one, you know, with the, the money or the ownership of these things. And he was given property away to her stepmother's family and Lizzie did not like that and Emma did not like that but Lizzie really resented that resented her stepmother so she had a long burning anger toward her stepmother it seems the number 10 reason is that although Lizzie appeared to have a somewhat better relationship with her distant and forbidding father there were problems there as well 
Lizzie was outraged, for example, when her father beheaded pigeons in the barn loft which she had built a roost. Her father thought the pigeons attracted neighborhood boys who broke into the barn to hunt the pigeons. Now, I've read some accounts that that made Lizzie angry, and I've read other accounts that that really didn't anger her too much, that that, you know, she was just mad at her parents for other reasons, and, you know, so they got on her nerves. You remember, they're all adults living in the same home. These aren't two adults and kids. You know, her and her sister were older adults, ne never married, both single, or back then, you know, I guess they called them old maids because they had never married or didn't have children. But, you know, I've read different accounts regarding that story that you know, she some said that she was upset with her father about the pigeons and other accounts said that it wasn't really a big deal to her about the pigeons. But regardless, if that story is true or not, whether she was upset with him about that, she had plenty of other reasons to be upset with him if she was mad and jealous of her stepmother getting money and properties from her father. The number 11 reason that Professor Linder thinks Lizzie Borden committed these murders is in the week before the murders following an apparent family argument. So they had been arguing a long time before the murders happened. Lizzie and her sister Emma left Fall River by coach for New Bedford. When Lizzie returned, she chose to stay in a rooming house for four days rather than in her own room in the family residence. So Lizzie was so mad she didn't return to the home. Her sister Emma returned to the home, but Lizzie refused to return to the home and stayed in a rooming house. Even though she was back in town and where her parents lived was her home too, she didn't go there. So that just shows another, you know, the level of anger she had toward them. And also it could have been where she planned out specifically or thought about how she would murder them. And she came up with the idea to buy the poison, but that didn't work out. So she ended up going to another idea, which was to just hack them to death. The number 12 reason is in 1991, cash and jewelry were stolen from the master bedroom in the Borden home. It was an open secret that Lizzie was suspected as having been the thief. Lizzie also had been accused by several local merchants of shoplifting. Yes, murder is far different than stealing, but it does suggest that Lizzie was hardly a model daughter. And that's going back to my theory that she was capable of committing these murders because she was a psychopath. And, you know, sometimes people who are capable of committing one certain other kinds of crimes are are also capable of committing violent types of crimes. And the fact, you know, she didn't just, you know, you can say, well, she, oh, she had a lot of anger toward her parents of over money and stuff. So that's why she stole from them. And some people are like, oh, stealing from your family. That's, you know, that can happen in families in the same home for whatever reason. Maybe she needed some cash and she couldn't get it from her father or something. So that could happen. But you got to remember, she also st stole from stores in the area. She was a shoplifter. So, you know, being a shoplifter, stealing from strangers, you know, and without, you know, not having the fear of getting caught, apparently. Because I read also before that it was just, you know, her father let the merchants know that if she stole anything to just put it on his tab or to let him know and he would cover it. So that just shows a level of dishonesty that Lizzie had and also just a level of, you know, she had the ability and the desire to steal from others and she didn't care if they were, you know, family members or not family members or who they were. Uh, like uh, a sense of entitlement. She was maybe spoiled. Maybe she knew her father would take care of it. So she just got what she wanted. So I'm not exactly sure, you know, like if she, did she hide stuff under her dress in a pocket in a purse or did she just walk out with it knowing that her father would cover it or something. So, but anyway, apparently Lizzie Borden was a thief in addition to being a murderer, in my opinion. Okay, the number 13 reason is that immediately after the discovery of her parents' bodies, 
Lizzie sent various persons who came to help off on various errands. It seemed strange that a woman would choose to remain alone in a house if she thought a murderer still might be nearabouts on the loose. And that is a very good point. Unless you're the murderer, why would you not be scared that somebody had just hacked up two people, two people who in your family, your father and your stepmother, no matter, even if you hated your parents, your, you and your parents fight all the time. If, if you just come in the house one day and your parents are in a bloody murdered mess on the floor, hacked up, you're going to react. You're going to run screaming from the home. You're going to leave the home. You're not going to stay in the home if you think somebody might still be in there or just to fear you won't, don't want to be alone in the home because you don't know what happened, what's going on. She was too calm. She is, you know, and I don't care how, you know, some personalities are different, but I don't care. And people have different life experiences, but this was not something that had happened to her before. This was not something that she would be used to. This was, you know, she was not in law enforcement or she wasn't a doctor where she's seen dead bodies a lot. She, you know, she didn't live in a very high crime area. It's not like people are getting hacked up every day in her town. It's not something that she should be used to, but yet she didn't run out of the house screaming or just run out of the house. She don't have to run out of the house screaming just because she's a female. You know, you can't assume that she'll just scream and overreact and go all crazy, but you have got to think that male, female, child, adult, no matter what, if you walk into a home and you find your father dead on the sofa, hacked up, and your stepmother dead on the floor, face down, hacked up, that you would be in fear. And I believe, you know, she didn't find her stepmother, uh, uh, you know, apparently, according to her stories, she, uh, you know, found her father dead. So she didn't know, you know, according to her story, you know, she didn't know about her stepmother being upstairs dead. But if you walk into the home and you find your father dead, you know, you don't just call out for the maid or whatever. I mean, you get the heck out of there. You don't say, Maggie, Maggie, come quick. Father's dead. I found father's dead or whatever. Someone's come in and killed him. <laughs> you get the heck out of there. That's just a natural reaction. So that's one big reason that I believe she committed the murders or that to me that shows to me that she committed the murders and not somebody else. And it also you got to think she was sending various people and this is just my theory, not Professor Linda Linders and his number 13 reason, but to add on to his number 13 reason where he says immediately after the discovery of her parents' bodies, Lizzie sent various persons who came to help off on various errands. You know, like he said, why would she do that? It, you know, why wouldn't she be afraid to stay alone in the house? But also, why was she doing that? Why didn't she run out of the house and run, get help, scream for people? I mean, her father's hacked up. You know, he's dead. It's not like she's sitting there holding his hand. Oh, father, father, please come back to life. <laughs> I believe, and my theory is, this is a lot of the time when she got rid of certain evidence or her, hid certain evidence. She didn't get rid of it because she didn't have, you know, the time and the space to get rid of it completely. But she hid a lot of evidence. And that helped her case so much because back then, the cops, you know, weren't about to like strip search a female daughter of a murdered victim, a female person, of, you know, for any reason, really, back then. Back then, it's a different time. You know, in the late 1800s, the cops weren't just going to come in and, you know, search the whole house thoroughly and look up in all her drawers and do a strip search of her or make her lift up her dress. Um, you know, they did not do a thorough search. Now they could have searched the house. They didn't have to search her person, but they could have did a thorough search of the house and found some things, but they didn't until a few days later. So I think, you know, during this time when she's sending people off, she had a more time to get rid of certain things or, or rearrange them or put them in a different place. And when I'm talking about things, I'm talking about bloody clothing, whether it be a bloody dress or a bloody, um, what do you call it? undergarment, like a bloody slip, you know, whatever they was wearing back then. 
bloody boots, bloody whatever, whatever she had on when she committed the murder, she had time to put that in a spot where she didn't think they would find it and they didn't find it. And so that's when days later, somebody witnessed her burning a dress. And I think it was that dress that she wore that she said had paint on it. But I believe it was the dress that she wore when she committed the murders. But the cops didn't find it because she hid it very well. And that's another reason why I don't believe the theory that she hacked them up when she, uh, while she was naked. Because although that sounds good, a good way to hide evidence or whatever, um, you know, she had blood on a dress that she was burning, there would be no need to burn a dress if she had committed the murders while she was naked and then just, you know, washed her hands out real good and put on a dress. And probably her face too, because you know, when you're hitting people with blunt force trauma, you know, blood splatters. And so in addition to getting like on the walls or the floor or what, whatever, it would probably splatter her person. And it was probably on the dress. It would be small splatters, depending on, you know, which direction the blood was going to. But she would have blood on her face, hands, arms, dress, whatever, possibly her shoes. She had time to wipe down her shoes. And, and my theory is before she ever called Maggie to, you know, discover her father's body after she found her father's body, supposedly, and she called Maggie to come down and see, I believe that she had already washed off her boots or changed her boots or whatever and she just you know did real well and she hid the axe that she used or she wiped off the handle or whatever and put that somewhere and hid it and then put the the head of the axe that she washed off down in the basement that's one theory that police have i don't know there might be another whole axe that she had that she totally hid and the cops never found it because um, she had plenty of time. She had several days to get rid of that because remember on the day of the murders, they did not do a thorough search. They did take, and they didn't even take the ax that was broken off in the basement that day. They got it several days later. So she lucked out on a lot because the police didn't search her person. And back then they really wouldn't have anyway. And I think she even might've said that she was on her period. If I, if I remember correctly, I read that at, in one place in a book. But remember, there's so many books about this case that you can't believe everything you read or hear about this case because a lot of authors just come up with their own theories that may not be true. So I don't know if that was discussed in the trial or not. The trial transcript is very long. I've read a lot of it, but I could have missed that part in it if it was discussed. And, you know, Really, stuff like that probably wasn't discussed at the trial back then. So, you know, for, just just know that back then they did not search her person. They did not search her well. She could have had a bloody dress on under the dress that she was wearing. She could have, or a bloody slip or or whatever, bl bloody uh, pantyhose or un other undergarments or whatever. They did not search her person or her room or the house very well when they first came. It was days later that they came back and searched. And the number 14 reason that Professor Linder thinks means that she did in fact commit these murders is that on August 7th, three days after the murders, Alice Russell, remember Alice Russell, the neighbor, observed Lizzie burning a blue corduroy dress in a kitchen fire. When asked about it, Lizzie explained that she chose to destroy the dress because it was stained with old paint. And I think, you know, just days after your parents are murdered, are you going to be burning a dress that has paint on it? No, I don't think so. Unless you need to get rid of evidence. And I think that's just one of the times that she was getting rid of evidence. So she got rid of that dress because it had blood evidence on it. And that was just three days after the murders. So luckily, Alice Russell did witness that. But still, even with all of this, you know, circumstantial evidence, because the police back then just didn't um, search the home and her person like they would today. And even today, you know, a lot of times they make mistakes. <laughs> but back then, it just wasn't done like it is today. Sh she was able to be found not guilty at trial. But I think she's guilty. 
So I think she was very lucky that, well, also the, the jury on her, her trial were men, were 12 men. You know, men back then had a hard time thinking of a woman as a cold-hearted murderer. So that could be one reason or a big part of the reason why they found her not guilty. It could also believe, be because, you know, they honestly looked at all the evidence and they just didn't have, you know, the smoking gun evidence that they needed or wanted to convict a female or any person of murder and possibly send her to her death or life in prison, which I think back then it would have been death. <laughs> um, so they just didn't want to do that. For whatever reason, the evidence at trial was not enough for the jury. And remember, she had several lawyers. So it was, you know, a case may look black and white um, to us, but once you get into court, you know, court changes everything because it's all a show. And it's like the prosecutors and the defense attorneys and the judge can make things seem one way or the other. You know, things change, people's perception changes. So she was able to be found not guilty. However, for the rest of her life, she was ostracized by the community. So it was not like people thought she was innocent. The jury might have thought she was innocent or they thought there wasn't enough evidence to convict her, but she was ostracized for the rest of her life for most of the community. And so obviously people felt that she was guilty as heck. So those 14 reasons per, from Professor Linder are a major part of the reasons why I think Lizzie did commit the murders. And I have several more reasons why I think that I sort of explained also in this video of why I think she committed the murders. So she was lucky she got off. You know, that happens sometimes. Guilty people get found not guilty. Doesn't mean they didn't commit the murders. It just means there wasn't enough evidence to convict them or the jury did not want to convict them. You know, I, I'm thinking that if she had been a man, a male, a son, if she had been the son of um, Mr. Borden rather than the daughter, she might have been convicted because back then, you know, it was... You know, they did look at women and men differently. And so I think her being a female helped her out a lot. And I wonder if back then if she knew that or thought that. When she was found not guilty, she fainted. And, and that, or excuse me, I think, no, excuse me. When they brought her parents' skulls in for evidence, remember during autopsy, they cut their heads off and they, they actually had the skulls in the trial in the courtroom. She fainted, and that's something a lot of women did back then was faint. Um, a lot of people faint, but you know back then it was more common for women when they saw something hideous or violent or gross or whatever they'd faint. Whether it's a real faint or not, I don't know. If I saw my parents' skull after they had been murdered, I'd probably want to faint. But, you know, if she committed the murder, she, she, that wouldn't scare her. Because if you can hack somebody to death with all that blood and gore, then just seeing a skull with no, you know, bodily tissue left on it wouldn't make you faint, I don't think. So I think that was probably an act, which still happens today. A lot of women faint in court. And are they faint, fainting for real or not? I don't know. I just remember I saw a case the other day on YouTube. Where this lady who murdered or tried to murder, he, he survived, thankfully, but who tried to murder her husband or ex-husband fainted after she got the verdict. And I'm not sure if that was real or not. I kind of think that was fake, too, but who, who knows, you know, being found guilty can make probably make a lot of people faint because they, they don't want to go to prison for the rest of their lives or for a long period of time. So anyway, that's my theory and why I believe Lizzie Borden did commit these murders. In my next video, I'm going to discuss other suspects who might have committed the murders, even though I really don't think they did. There are or were back then other suspects who the police looked at. And and throughout the time, throughout history, other you know writers and authors, newspaper columnists and so forth, other people who they think 
committed the murders rather than Lizzie. So I'm going to have a video where, where I discuss the other suspects in this case because she was found not guilty. So technically there could have been other people that could have been prosecuted out there at the time. Of course, it's been so long now they're all dead. So, <laughs> so anyway, thank you for watching or thank you for listening to this part two. Of